Woohoo! Dallas Mavericks go into game four and handle their bitten L. Oh, no. Whoa. They missed how many free throws? We might have a problem. Well, that changed its tone awfully quickly. Game three looked like the Mavericks had figured things out. And going into game four, it really looked like they had things figured out. The Thunder were rudderless in this first half in particular. I mean, they trailed for most of the game, never by a ton. The lead was never bigger than 14, but it just felt like Dallas had an answer for everything OKC wanted to do. The Thunder were anemic offensively. Dallas's energy, its rebounding, its defense, just smothering the rotations. Derrick Jones Jr. made a huge series of plays in that first quarter, including swatting Josh Giddy into the upper decks of the AAC. Kyrie Irving, just a maestro controlling the game, not scoring, which we'll get into that, but just controlling the pace and flow of the game, being a masterful playmaker for others. And Luca, even though Luca couldn't buy himself a whole lot of offense, he was still defending his ass off and doing a great job at that. So I looked at all of this and the fact that the Thunder just didn't seem to have really rotational answers. Like they didn't seem to have counter punches to what Dallas was doing. They were sticking with the same rotations. They were trying to do the same things. And other than Shea, they really had nothing going for them to the fact, to the extent where like their own media people were kind of remarking. And again, when I say their own media people, I don't mean people that actually work for the Thunder. I mean, people that for a living cover the team, or at least in part of their living is covering the team. Even they were looking at this and saying like, the fact that they're not making adjustments, this is very Scott Brooks-esque, which if you're not familiar with Thunder history, that was their coach. Uh, you know, when they went to the finals in 2011, he was their second coach in franchise history, was there for a number of years, basically the multitude of the Russ, KD, Harden years, except for that last year with Scott, uh, not Scott Brooks, was uh, Billy Donovan. But Scott Brooks had faults, blind spots, shall we say, in his game. And part of this idea of like the Thunder way and the culture was like, you kind of do what you do and you don't make a lot of changes other than they limited Giddy. But they didn't really make a lot of changes to what Dallas was doing. And so even their, their media people, their fans and creators, content creators, were looking at this and saying like, it doesn't make sense to never make a change to the lineup or to make changes to address what the other team is doing here. And it's not a good sign that they don't seem to have a counterpunch to everything Dallas is throwing at them. This is their back against the wall if they go down 3-1 here. Dallas saying earlier in the day, they were playing as if this was a must win. And for the first half, especially, it looked like they genuinely believed that for about a quarter and a half of the second half. I felt that they generally believed it, even though the offense got bad. I think only like 15 points in the third quarter. That was bad. The defense was still good. Very, very good, in fact. But Dallas absolutely, almost inexplicably pissed this game away. Now, yes. You cannot take anything from Shea Gilgis Alexander. Phenomenal. Biggest game of his life, and he showed up. Box score tells you he missed 13 shots. I didn't feel like he missed 13 shots. I felt like he missed like three shots in the game. It felt like he was so, so solid. And the fact that OKC, despite shooting, what was it, like 32% in the first half, it was something just really, really bad. And in the first quarter, they were 0 of 6 from 3. Dallas came out and was shooting very well from 3. Uh, at the half, OKC was still, yeah, 36%. And in in that, yeah, that was yeah that the first quarter, though. Um, OKC was just anemic. And Dallas was getting a lot of assists. Kyrie, again, the maestro out there, absolutely 
throwing dimes, picking apart the Thunder defense. And then the energy and everything just looked like, okay, Dallas has figured them out and they're, they're running away with this. This is absolutely Dallas's game here. And the Thunder just looked every bit of their age, which is to say young and inexperienced. But then Dallas started to do some, some silly shit, as they often do. They don't like things to be too easy, it seems, because they never, they've had OKC down on the map. They had their leg raised, ready to place it down on their throat. But they wouldn't do it. They never, like I said, they never, even though the Thunder offense was anemic, they would not ever extend their lead beyond 14 points. And yes, we hovered around 10 for the longest time. But it was concerning because OKC was still getting to the line. They, they do that. They absolutely do that. And they shot a lot more free throws in this game than Dallas did. But even with that, I felt like the officiating honestly wasn't bad. I thought this was one of the better officiated games of the series so far. No, no cap. And OKC was getting to the line and they were making them. OKC overall, what did they shoot overall? I think there was like, they missed one free throw, I believe. Just absolutely nails at the foul line. Compare that to Dallas. And uh, yeah, you got a problem here. OKC went 23 of 24 at the line. Dallas shot 23 free throws as well. Oh, even, yeah. Except Dallas went 12 of 23. That's 52%. Luca had two free throws down two with 10 seconds left. Missed the first one. Uh, Lively. Missed a, a big free throw in the last couple of minutes. Derek Jones missed a big free throw in the last few minutes. Everybody missed. Kai missed one. Almost missed the first one even. Um, so when he went to the trip, uh, his trip to the line, just not good. That's your difference. That and the fact that in the first quarter, Dallas was playing with so much energy, they were kind of reckless. They had 13 turnovers for the game. I think seven of those were in like the first quarter and a half. They kind of settled down, but then they got a little bit sloppy again with the ball. And the Thunder, they had nothing going for them offensively. The Thunder shot 38% for the game, 26% from three, 7 of 27. Their second best player, J-Dub, 5 of 19 from the field, 0 of 2 from three. Lou Dort ended up having a huge game here, and he was still 3 of 10 from three, 4 of 14 overall. This was Shea dragging Pretty much everybody with him. Holmgren had a big game again, 18 and 9, 6 of 9 from the field, uh, four blocks. His presence was felt. It was really, it was really just Shea being remarkable in his shot making, particularly in that second half. And just the Thunder defense just saying, like, all right, our offense isn't here, but we're just gonna buckle down and we're just gonna do everything we can. And Dallas's offense got so, so ugly. In that third quarter, that third quarter really spelled trouble for Dallas because they scored just 15 points after 30 in the first quarter, 24. They're up 10 after one uh, up 11, I think, at the half, 24 points in the second quarter, only 15. They do rebound with 27 then. But then the defense, which had been so smothering, holding them to holding the Thunder 20, 23 and 22, suddenly gave up 35. And it's not like they were getting those predominantly at the foul line. Like, again, SGA was just hitting almost everything. He got one toilet bowl fallout shot that would have iced the game basically with like 30 or less than that seconds left because then I think the next possession uh, was... Uh, I was going to say the next possession was Luka getting fouled, but no, that's not the case. Point being, they, they just fell apart, Dallas did offensively. Luka... He was 4 of 13 shooting the ball in the first half. This was a really I, I don't I don't care that he had a triple double. And I know some people are gonna say, like, oh well, Lucas held the higher standards. You're damn right, Luca has held the higher standards. He's an MVP finalist. I know he's beat up. I know he's hurt. My problem is the tunnel vision he's playing with. My my problem is the fact that even when he's playing great defense throughout this game, he'll miss a shot on the other end and his body language is bad. These are the things I have a problem with. Like, I have criticisms of Kyrie in this game, too, despite the very, very overwhelming po positive stuff I said earlier. Most of my problems have to do with second-half offense of Kyrie. 
especially closing time, fourth quarter Kyrie. But Luca here, the difference in Kai, even in game two where he had nine points compared to this game, when Kai is not scoring the ball, he's finding other ways to impact the game and lead. And his body language seems to be always positive for his team. Luca, he's he's putting in the effort defensively, but his body language is still bad and he's still frustrated and he's getting tunnel vision. And I talked about this uh, at, at times. I talked about it last series a little bit before the series, like in my preview. And I talked about it in my preview for this one. Like Luca will get tunnel vision when he's struggling and he's just going to push and try to force the issue. And he wants to get back at a guy. If a guy is getting under his skin, is being overly physical with him. He's going to go out of his way to try and just destroy that person. And when he's hitting, it's a thing of beauty. And when he's not, it becomes a detriment to an extent. And that's kind of how I felt here because Luca goes six of 20, worse than his game one performance. That was six of 19, two of nine from three, four of six at the line, seven turnovers. He does get a block and two steals. He's only a plus one on the game. I don't care that he had a triple-double, 18, 12, and 10. Cool, man. Cool. I understand it's a higher bar for you, but it should be a higher bar for you. You're one of the three to five best players in the league. I, at times when you're healthy, you can make the argument you're the best. That is all entirely true. Injured or not, you have to be able to do better than that. And when I say better than that, by the way, I don't mean make more of your shots. That would be great. But I mean, get quality possessions. That third quarter, the offense got ugly. Now, part of it was OKC really battening down, fighting for their season as you knew they would. But part of it as well is just Luca forcing the issue with all of these little chippy shots. And he's not he's not converting on them. A lot of bad empty possessions there. Um, just not not in a rhythm. And it was stunting the entire team. That's why that's why the offense went from very, you know, I'm not gonna say like great, but solid in the first half in terms of touches and all that. PJ Washington was a monster again in this game. PJ Washington, 21 points yet again, his third straight 20 point game. I don't know that he did hardly anything in the second half. He he was a he was a beast for them for the first half. He still hit another five threes in the game. He vanished in the last quarter and a half offensively, and I feel like it was the distribution of touches where that really came into play. That's a problem for me when you have when you have things break down the Thunder are clawing back into this game. Thunder led like 4-2 in this game and then seized the lead when they went up. I think it was 96-93 that they went up or something like that. They took a three-point lead um, late in the game, like a couple minutes left, and it was their first lead since 4-2. And Dallas... You know, they got some quick baskets and stuff, but it just, they never really secured things. And Kai had a couple of times where he tried to do something. We were saying like, oh, there's not going to be another game this series where Kai's held the single digits. Bro, Kyrie Irving had nine points again. Four of 11 from the field, 0 of 2 from 3, 1 of 2 at the line. He only had one turnover. That's great. He played great defense. I, I'm not upset at Kai in terms of his playmaking because he had nine assists as well. His playmaking was great. His defense was solid. But in offense, offensively speaking, when Dallas needed to, to stem the bleeding, to stop the bleeding, and to score in clutch time, in, in the crunch, Luka wasn't having it that game. He was not finding it. And it was not getting better as we went further in. That needed to be Kai. And the couple of times Kai felt like he was trying to take it, he wasn't, he wasn't finishing, whether it was him with a pull-up jumper. He tried his transition three and got blocked. And that was kind of one of those like, mm, you know, I know that's like one of your, like one of your money shots, but you've done it so many times this postseason. I'm not shocked. Somebody finally just perfectly timed it to block you. Like I'm not, but man, and I think it was Case and Wallace that did it, a rookie. Um, although I am really impressed with what I see from him defensively. I think he could be a, an all defensive type guy potentially in his career, but I, it just Dallas just pissed this one away. There's not a lot of other ways to say it. You had Derek lively 
he 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 looks banged up a little bit. Looks like he's got uh, a hamstring. Maybe he plays twenty five minutes, seven point six boards, three of seven from the field. He does give you four blocks. That's tremendous. Blocks was actually one of the categories that was great for Dallas in this. Gafford had ten and eight, and also added in three blocks. I think Dallas had a franchise record for blocks in this game with yeah thirteen blocks. That's a franchise record for the Mavericks. That is phenomenal. And you know they won the the assist battle twenty six to eighteen. Three pointers as bad as the you know thirty four percent. Not like they were great, but even with that being ho hum, it's still a lot better than the Thunder's twenty six percent. Shot as many free throws as the Thunder. The difference is that the Thunder made all but one, and you made one more than half, one more than half of your attempts. There's your difference in the game. You missed clutch free throw after clutch free throw, and it was not just. You're not great free throw shooters like Derek Jones Jr. and Derek Lively. You had Luca miss. And yeah, I realized until this year, we would have pretty much classified Luca as a not great free throw shooter as well. But he had been good this year, including in the playoffs. This was a higher pressure situation. I understand that. But it is what it is. The baggage, the burden you carry as the superstar is you have to deliver in those moments if you're one of the best players. Dirk got killed when he missed in 2006. I think it was game three. He missed a free throw in the cru- uh, in the clutch that could have tied the game in the closing seconds, and he ended up getting that win. And it was a big win for turning that series around. Uh, obviously, other factors, but you get my point. Dirk was criticized for that. He was killed for that. Um, and so that's the burden you just gotta you gotta carry. So you're missing numerous free throws there, and on the other end. SGA is running wild, and there was only one shot he attempted that just inexplicably rimmed out. Otherwise, you would have been in a situation to not even not even uh, have the chances you did down the stretch because he would have iced it earlier. So, a, a just remarkably disappointing performance for Dallas, I think. And it's it's really a shame because the energy was so good. OKC was held to 43 points in the first half. And as long as, you know, my feeling was like, as long as you limit the turnovers and don't just put OKC on the foul line a ton, you should be all right. Now, OKC still shot 24 free throws, obviously, but Dallas's defensive rotations and overall just effort, I thought were great. The rebounding became problematic because OKC did start to rebound better. I've said before, OKC is not a great rebounding team, but you only beat them by two here. And offensive glass, you gave up 12. I know you also had 12, but rebounding is usually a a more sizable advantage for Dallas. And they barely won that battle in this game. And I feel like a lot of that came in the second half where OKC just, they wanted it more. They fought harder for it. Dallas, I said earlier, does not like to make things too easy on themselves. That's really what it feels like. Because they played for about uh, one half of basketball, maybe you could say the first half of the third quarter legitimately, like what P.J. Washington said, this was a must win for them because they did not want to give up home court advantage and have to go back to OKC tied with the Thunder believing. And then they kind of regressed. Maybe it's because they're beat up. Maybe it's because they're tired. They regressed. They did not have their foot on OKC's throat. They let up. OKC got up off the mat and just started throwing haymakers. And because Dallas had not built up enough of a lead, they not only claw back into the game, but by the end, they're the ones delivering the the knockout blows, the knockdown blows. And Dallas, I don't think they ever got like, quote unquote, knocked out in this game. It's not like OKC pulled away or anything at the end. But the fact remains, they won the decision and you can't argue it. You lose a game by four points in which you made, what did I say? Out of 24 free throw attempts, you made, I think, 13. 12 of 23. That's what it was. 12 of 23 free throw attempts. Bro, you lost this game. OKC, yeah, they had grit and they had fight and heart and all that. And that's great. And I know that their people are touting like, oh, this is one of the best wins in Thunder history. I'm like, calm down, young man. Calm down. You guys are still a pretty new franchise, but I feel like even your memory is a little bit prisoner of the moment here because I can think of uh, like 2013, I think it was, 
against Memphis, you're down 2-1, and you end up going to overtime, and that's the Reggie Jackson breakout game where he saves the Thunder despite KD and Russ doing nothing and was able... So it wouldn't have been 2013. Man. I It's all blurring to me here. But is able to deliver um, just a sensational like 30-point performance in Memphis to claw that series back to even instead of a 3-1 deficit. To me, that one stands out more. And again, I'm a much more casual Thunder fan um, to that extent. So this is a gritty win for them, though. And I still feel like it's more about how you gave it away than what they did. They played great defense. They fought. They did everything they're supposed to do. And you still found a way in which only the one guy showed up. Again, I don't want to take too much from Chet. Chet had a good game. Of their key guys, several of them were not there offensively. But you allowed them to stay in it until they found a way. And that's purely your free throws. You make four more free throws. It's a tie game. Instead of losing 196, you're tied even just with four more free throws. But because you're getting empty possessions, like when Luca got fouled to go to the line with 10 seconds left, I was like, man, that's almost the last outcome I wanted of that drawn up play. You, you look at it and you're like, what do you mean? You don't want him attacking the basket? No, like Luca attacking the basket with how he shot the ball in, in those situations, like throughout this postseason, really, but especially in this game, I was like, I don't know that I want it in Luca's hands going there at that moment. I kind of would have rather created an open look for somebody else. I would have settled for trying to like, I know the mentality people are like, I hate when they settle for the three. If you dribble at the top of the key and then try a step back or whatever, then yes, I hate that too. But you can create a quality look for yourself there. And so how Dallas basically allowed this all to devolve. And yeah, trying to get the, the quick bu- bucket. But like Lucas beat up, going to the line in a high, high pressure situation. Your team has shot free throws abysmally to that point. I just didn't feel like that was the ideal thing there. And I know 2020 vision, right? He makes both free throws, ties the game. Maybe the outcome still goes a little bit differently. And I feel differently about it. Then we're looking at it kind of like the Derek Lively thing. I get it. We're prisoners at the moment. It's 2020 vision because just like game three's hack a Lively thing, if that had gone poorly, then kid putting Lively back in and him missing free throws and Dallas losing that game, we would be looking at that and saying like, Jason Kidd, what are you doing? You're an idiot. You put him in a chance for, in a position where he couldn't win. That's going to break the kid's confidence. That's not good. That's not good coaching. But instead it worked out. And so we're like, oh, kid, genius. You, you just built his confidence. And now... The team believes. Well, it's ironic that the story of game three came down to like key free throw shooting, helping decide the outcome, even if it wasn't in the final, final minutes. But that was one of the big takeaways we had was like, ah, free throws, man. Huge. Great. Awesome. Instead, game four, we're like, oh, my God, free throws. What the hell happened? And not even just with the big men, not even just with the big men. Like key guys not being able to knock down their free throws. Absolutely, absolutely mind boggling to be in that situation there. So let me look at the stat sheet here specifically. Kyrie, nine points again. Luca, 18. PJ Washington, again, leading the Mavericks with 21. You did get 17 out of Derrick Jones Jr., John Jr. had a great game. Not only one of five from three, he's not a three-point shooter, but he had four blocks. He had seven of 12 from the field, three boards and an assist. I love what Derek Jones Jr. gave you in 27 minutes. Absolutely loved it. Uh, Gafford, 10 and eight in 23 minutes, four of seven from the field. Again, three blocks. He was a minus five defensively, uh, not having the same impact, even though the rim protection was there. So I liked what we got from him. I'm a little concerned about Lively, 25 minutes, his production dropped off in every area other than blocks. The energy is there. The effort is there. I don't question that at all. But I felt like Chet got at him a little bit better in this game, and that was that was pretty key. Hardaway Jr. giveth and Hardaway Jr. taketh. Hardaway Jr. hit two mammoth threes in this game where I was like, okay, that's why you got the dude. And then in both times on the very next play, did something so boneheaded, whether it was defensively or just a a horrifically bad and ill-timed turnover or whatever, where you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is where you pay the Hardaway tax. And sometimes the tax not only offsets 
you know, what the, the payout was the play before, but uh, maybe it cancels it out. Maybe it's even puts you in debt a little bit there. So again, Hardaway got 23 minutes here. He got more minutes in this game. I didn't revisionist. You can say, re- I don't even like saying revisionist history here. And it's not even revisionist 2020 vision. I don't even like saying that because I feel like we have a, an overwhelming body of evidence that says Hardaway second half of the season in big minute opportunities has not been good for Dallas for the most part. Now he's had his moments in this series and that's awesome. But I felt like him having him in, in closing time was not good. And not even just in a situational thing, like rotate on, rotate off, just out there. I felt like kid coached a masterful game for about two and a half quarters. And then it went bad. And then it stayed bad. And I don't know. I think he fell back on bad habits in the end. That, that was my impression watching the end of that game unfold. Uh, Josh Green, 13 points as well. Shout out to Josh Green. Uh, I liked his impact on the, on the court. Only one of four from, from the field. But I, I know he's a minus 14, but I felt like he played... Hard defense, good energy. It's just um, one of those games where because he was having to deal a lot with SGA, uh, that that took a nosedive as as the Thunder made their move in the second half. Exum had a couple plays, back-to-back buckets, five points in five minutes, two of four from the field, one of one from three. He had uh, a nice bucket right around the rim and then splashed the three a moment later. So, hey, nice of you to make some sort of appearance, but we uh, we need more than that. So overall, what are my impressions of this, of this game? I don't, I don't look at this with gloom and dread saying that this is the breaking point where that confidence and all of that energy and positive vibes that the team has built up this postseason just collapsed, crumbled. I don't think it's that. While you could say... Hey, man, in game four against the Clippers, you you at least climbed out of the hole, even if you didn't get all the way out to win that game. That is something to hang your hat on. But this is kind of the inverse in a way. While you while you weren't the team with the giant lead, you controlled the whole game. You were in position the whole game. You you showed you were the better team and everything. If you just do your job in even four of those final 16 minutes of the game, you win. You win. Like, your defense was still good enough. Shea had to go into overdrive for them to just barely claw their way out against your defense. You had to self-destruct offensively. You had to not hustle enough on certain rebounds, and you had to miss Free throw after free throw after free throw after free throw. The Thunder were shooting 32% from the floor and two of 17 from three going into the fourth quarter. They won this game. I mean, just it, it really, really is incredible to me that you controlled the entire game and then you get to four like four minute, 30 second mark. And suddenly it's a two point game. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, closing time, we got Luca and Kyrie. And like Luca got a couple of assists, quick baskets there on alley oops and everything. And that was, that was sweet. Got him his triple double, got Mavericks a couple needed buckets, but there were also some bad possessions in there too. And there were moments where Kyrie tried to assert himself a little bit and it didn't go. Shots just weren't dropping. And sometimes that's the way it goes. OKC is a great defense. Kai is not a big player. He's shifty, crafty, and all that, but he is taking on added defensive uh, responsibilities, which is going to drain his reserves a little bit more. And the playmaking he's having to take on or choosing to take on, whether it's partly to alleviate Luka, who's hampered or whatever, I feel like we got to that moment and when we needed clutch Kai, he was just a little bit fatigued. Part of that's the nature of the playoffs. Part of that's the nature of the series. But the the thing is, you were having 
you were having to ask for the world. And he didn't have a world left to give you. He still could give you a good bit, but you didn't have quite enough to close the deal. So yeah, it's it's crazy to lose this game. If you shoot 60% at the line, it's over. That's five more made free throws. If you had shot just 60% from the foul line. I guess that's not the difference of five because you have 52, add five more in. Yeah, whatever. If you go 60% of the line, you basically handle your business. And uh, this was, to me, this was worse for Luca than game one. And I know I'm going at Luca here, and I know there's going to be people that are upset with me saying this. I'm not saying it because I'm saying Luca's a bad player. I'm not saying this because I'm like, I quit on Luca. I turned my back. No, this is what this is what we did even with Dirk. When we were talking 2007, MVP Dirk in a closeout game six loss, the first time an eight seed beats a one seed in a seven game series, Dirk was silent. Nothing. One of the wor- probably the worst playoff game of his career. Do you think we weren't critical of him? For that, do you, do you think we weren't like, bro, you were the MVP. How did you go silent into the night? Like, how did you at the very least not do something? You have to hold the, it, it's not, I know modern fandom is like, we're stands of our guys, of our, specifically our superstars. I don't like that culture. <laughs> I don't. And I'm not I'm not the old man shaking my fist at the cloud. To me, it's like, no, you demand more of your stars. If if PJ Washington is at the line with 10 seconds left and he makes one of two, I'm not upset at PJ. I'm like, oh, I wish you would come through there. But I understand, given your career free throw shooting and you in that position, it's not a superstar. Yeah, that's a superstar position. You're not a superstar. You've been brilliant for us in this series. But that's not a realistic expectation. That's a hell yes if you can deliver. And if you can't, well, I can't say I'm shocked. I'm not going to be mad at you for that. But if it's your superstar, if it's Luca, if it's Kyrie, it is simply a must. And if you want to say like, oh, come on, man, you're being too hard on him. The stage is all that matters. And he had another missed free throw at a different point in the game, too. So even take that one back if you're going to miss one here, you know, like make it where the the net difference is still the same. And maybe we have a slightly different conversation, but there's just too many of these moments where the Mavericks shot themselves in the foot. I don't think their team is broken. I don't think that their their swagger and their determination is broken. I'm worried that their bodies might be breaking a little bit. Luca, Luca looked hampered out there. Like I said, Lively looked like he he left to go to the locker room at one point with kind of a hamstring. He was limping off the court, came back and he kept playing, but I never felt like he had quite the same impact after he came back. Um, we know Gafford's been dealing with like a right arm or a right hand sort of issue, maybe both. I don't know. He's had an ankle and in, in a back at different times in the postseason as well. I don't know exactly what's wrong with Derek Jones Jr., but you've seen him beat to hell at times in the playoffs as well. Like these guys are laying everything out there. They're given everything they got. And the sad nature of it is, regardless of what happens the rest of the way in the series, even if you had handled your business last night, I don't think Dallas is going to get better than a 70% Luka Doncic the rest of the season. I just don't. There's not time to rest. I talked about this a little bit yesterday on the stream. There's not time to rest. There's not time to recuperate from all of his ailments all you can do is make the best with what you got you got to have the role player step up you got to have Kyrie step up and fortunately you're a well-constructed team with a lot of guys playing over their heads and I just can't help but wish like damn it I wish we had better health for Luca combined with this squad right now because Mavericks would be running away right now if you had even an 85% Luka Doncic with this team like it's playing right now. They've already run past the Thunder, you know, and like they'll have gone past them in like probably five games. I, I do feel like if you had a healthier Luka, this would have already been done. It, you should have been at 31 even with whatever he's at now, 65%, 60%. I don't know what he's at, but he's not there. He's not his full self. 
So it's, uh, it's really quite remarkable to be in this position and saying like this, you're not, you're never going to be healthier the rest of the way than you probably are right now. If you had gotten yourself extended rest, like collectively as a team, like if you had been able to handle your business and close out in five, and we said the same thing in the first round, by the way, uh, give yourself at least a little bit more rest, then you could have gotten some of your role guys a little bit better. Luca would have gotten a little bit better, but I think your, your picture today is probably the healthiest you're going to be the rest of the season. And with the number of ailments that are stacking up and the varying degrees to which they're a problem, that's a concern. OKC has just J Dub who had the ankle. Chet got banged around a little bit yesterday, uh, including bonked in the head unintentionally by Lively. Um, but OKC is healthy. They're young. They're also a great defense with a good coach. He, I felt like Dagonal first half. I didn't really understand what he was doing. At the very least, he kept his team together fighting in the second half, and they clawed their way back to. I feel like one of the more improbable victories um, of the postseason so far for any, any team, just the postseason in general. But I don't know. Uh, I'm still trying to make full sense of kind of what we watched yesterday because as this was as this was going on, even with like six minutes left in the game yesterday, just based on how everything had gone to that point. And what we'd kind of seen and been conditioned to anticipate from our superstars down the stretch, I thought like, okay, they're probably going to play around with their food a little bit, but they'll do just enough. The question then will be, okay, Thunder with absolutely everything on the line, Dallas beaten down, gassed, and, you know, beat up like they are, are they going to be able to handle that just insane crowd I anticipate in Oklahoma City in game five? That that was I was already starting to think in terms of that, and you always got to be careful doing that, right? When you start to look ahead, that tends to be when you don't see the right hook coming right for your jaw, and uh, that's exactly what happened here. I, I felt like Dallas got out, got the lead, cruised for a while, held OKC down every time they tried to stand up, and then even as OKC was making that last push to ultimately take the lead and take control of the game. I feel like Dallas just assumed we got this and like we're going up 3-1 and it didn't feel like they handled their business. When the pressure flipped finally to put the pressure on Dallas, they were the ones going to the line and crumbling at the pressure. That is very problematic. Now, fortunately, it doesn't, that's not an indictment on like what they could do or what they might achieve the rest of the way. Sometimes shit just happens, but I, it is something I'm going to watch. I'm going to be curious how they respond, particularly with free throws, because, uh, you know, we saw shoot around yesterday morning, the Mavericks all loose and relaxed and dancing and shooting half court shots and everything. And I understand it's always, always just like the tail end portion of practice and everything, but they were vibing, right? And then you see them have that kind of free throw performance. And it's like, I don't wish you had spent five, 10 more minutes on free throws, guys. <laughs> your, your dance video or your dance party. That was, that was cool, man. But, uh, that's kind of one of those things when you, when you have a performance like you had in a crucial area where you lost a game, you had no business losing. That's going to look bad, um, from that standpoint. But it's a nitpick. We'll see how they do. We'll see how they respond. I'm anticipating I'm anticipating a healthy dose of Kai and I want to see how this team fights. This is really a moment. DJ Washington's been sensational this whole series, but this is really a moment for me where PJ Washington and Derek Jones Jr. in particular, also like Josh Green, uh, Derek Lively, those four in particular. I think are going to be so, so huge in game five because it's the energy, it's the rebounding, it's the defense. That's what we need. I, we're going to get, I think, a healthier dose of Kai. And I think hopefully Luca a little bit reeled in, a little bit under control. And if they can combine that with some free throw shooting, we'll, we'll see what we got in game five. But uh, we'll just see. Let me know in the comments, what do you think? How much of a disaster was this? Are you suddenly shaken? 
I, I know I say it all the time, man. You win, you feel like you're never going to lose again. You lose, you feel like you're never going to win again. Don't get too high, too low. Don't give up on the team. It's okay to have apprehensions and concerns, but don't don't throw it in just because, oh, no, we should have been a 3-1. Now it's 2-2. I hear you. It's disappointing. But there's still time to respond, and this team, I think, has done enough to prove and to show that it deserves our trust in it. By the way, home crowd, you sucked again. I, where the hell did you go from that Clippers game four? That, that's my question. Where are you? Home court advantage has been non-existent these last two games, and now we got to go into that crowd in Oklahoma City. I was going to say, <laughs> I almost said the Ford Center, but my God, is that an old reference? They were Chesapeake, and now they're like Paycom or something. I, I, I hate naming rights of arenas. But uh, now you got to go into their house, and it's going to be absolutely raucous. Let me know in the comments how you're feeling. What are you thinking? Like the video, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.